Welcome to the Catholic Teachers Lounge, the only podcast for Catholic school teachers by Catholic school teachers. I'm Jill Annabel. I'm here with Colleen McCoy Sika. Again, we're going to be uh, connecting and celebrating and exploring topics together. We are so grateful to Loyola Press for sponsoring us and for you, the teachers, for doing what you do every day. Hi, Jill. Hi. It's great to be here today. And for the for the first time, we have a special guest in the lounge. Um, there's usually a special guest in the lounge, but sometimes we get wrapped up in our own conversation. But today, the conversation is really going to be about Joelle and Cicero. Welcome to the lounge with us and to the Thank conversation. You. I'm so glad to be here. We're happy to have you. It's been a long time since I've been in the <laughs> teacher's lounge. <laughs> is that right? Yes. So, but you've been, so you're the president and publisher of Loyola Press. Correct. And you've been at Loyola Press for a while. You were in, in different roles in different capacities, but rewind a little bit. So you were a mm -hmm. teacher. Yes. Okay. I began my teaching career in 1987. I taught um, for two and a half years, three years in Michigan. Um, I taught for a year in Illinois, and then I taught for three years in the state of California. Oh, wow. My husband kept moving me around the country. Mm. And what did those I lounges to... look like? <laughs> well, so in Michigan, it was in a very small town called Coldwater, and the building was very old, and the teacher's lounge was very old sure. and had borrowed furniture. Uh, absolutely. Why would it not? Right. right. Exactly. In Illinois, the school was newer, and the teacher's lounge was pretty well appointed, I would have to say. And then in California, I was in a brand new science and technology magnet mm -hmm. school, oh. and it was incredible. So I would say I I kept upgrading yeah. accidentally. <laughs> Maybe you did that in their interview. Like, they were interviewing you, but you were yeah. really checking out the lounge. Checking out the lounge. <laughs> <saying that. laughs> I want to skip ahead a little bit because I, I am very curious about how everything that you've done since your teaching days um, into what you've done in publishing here at Loyola Press and how, how that ties together. But there's one really interesting um, role that you had along the way, and that was working with Fred Rogers. I was Mr. Rogers' editor for two years. Wow. <laughs> so I know. And um, I learned... Um, almost everything I needed to know about being a better human and a better editor from Mr. Rogers. Mm -hmm. So um, after my teaching career, or what sort of ended my teaching career, was me going home and saying to my husband, are you going to keep moving me around the country? Mm -hmm. Because if you are, there's no reciprocity with teaching certificates. Right. So every time we moved, it, it was um, a, a real process. challenge and very yeah. expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, yes, I am. And I said, okay, I need to find a job that will move with me. So I applied. It's back when you applied for jobs through newspaper ads. Remember those days? Ooh. There was an ad in the newspaper for a company called Creative Teaching Press. They're in Huntington Beach, California. And um, I applied for this job, and they plucked me right out of the classroom and taught me how to turn on a computer. Um, I learned pretty quickly that I, I had some skills, editing skills, but also I think it was more um, creative skills in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I knew how to make lessons come alive and be more fun and help teachers um, really enrich the experience for kids. Mm -hmm. And so that translated in the books that I worked on. I want to say, though, most teachers don't know their skill set because it's such an isolating profession. So I right. would imagine that in in that transition was the reflection of, oh, I have creative ideas. And not every teacher can come up with these things without someone to bounce it off of. I think every time I moved to a new state and a new school environment, that really forced me. Mm -hmm. I had to learn the culture, but also the kids. And they were vastly different in all of the states. But it forced me to become creative because I didn't get complacent. Every time I moved, I had to sort of reinvent Mm -hmm. myself and what uh, how I was going to teach. So that's how I landed with Fred Rogers. Um, Creative Teaching Press um, desired to do some books with him um, that were uh, 
a series of books called the Grow and Learn with Mr. Rogers series. And the essentially the premise was if you were in a preschool or a child care center and you showed um, an episode or a clip from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, then you would have classroom activities that would spring from the shows. And so uh, I had to fly to Pittsburgh and pitch. Uh, at the time, it was called Family Communications, Inc. And I had to pitch Mr. Rogers and his team. Mm. And I'll never forget, they were all very straight-faced. Um, and he was <laughs> not in the room at the first meeting. And uh, I had no idea. And I was really young. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I was really young. I was maybe... 30. I mean, it was pretty young to be in there. And, uh, and when I left one, one of the ladies who, you know, has become a friend of mine over the years, knocked me on my arm when I was leaving. And she said, good job. Most people don't get this far. And that, and then I left and I thought, well, so then my boss called and said, how did it go? And I said, think it went well. I'm not quite sure. Someone hit me and said, we don't usually get that far. And then I got a call back. Um, and that's when things got serious and we were able to, to, I was able to go on set the for, for the first time and meet Mr. Rogers and, and then working with him was a very interesting experience. I mean, he was exactly the same in real life as he was on TV. And I think I, I met a saint. I yeah. really believe I met yeah. a saint. He was a good, kind man who understood children and understood the, the people who love and care for them and were working um, with children. And in between Mr. Rogers and Loyola Press, I worked for a lot of different publishing companies um, in various capacities, writer, editor, managing editor. Um, and... Um, when I landed at Loyola Press and I walked in the building, I had the same sort of feeling at Loyola that I did when I was in the neighborhood. And mm. I thought, okay, mm. I think I found my, mm. you know, mm. home. So I'm I'm curious then, do you channel the things that you learned from him? Did you channel any of that into the children's books that you wrote? And 100%. He, okay. So... One of the things that I didn't realize that I took away from him until I watched his documentary, um, people ask me all the time about, you know, the themes that you write about or why you love your job. And I always say it's because I want children to understand that they are loved and lovable. They have to understand that they are valued and valuable and to take that a step further and bring it into the faith realm. And I'm going to get a little choked up here, but... Um, People are going to let you down. Grown-ups are going to let you down. But if you understand that there's someone above, divine, God, who loves you, then you're going to figure out how to navigate this world. And I think it's so easy to forget. And when you're little, you just don't understand. So um, when I watched the documentary, it was like watching home movies, mm. by the way. The Mr. Rogers documentary was really interesting. But he said he wants children to know that they are loved and lovable. And I thought, well, that mm. seeped in somehow. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think yeah. it goes into everything I do. Um, and I try to do professionally and personally. Great. So then let's let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about um, curriculum development. Yeah. And, you know, we've all that's been- That's our jam. That's our jam. We've all been to teacher school. And there are, there's a lot that we learn in teacher school, and then there's really a lot that we don't learn in teacher school. And I have yet to meet a teacher that comes out, self-included, understanding how to integrate all of the standards from all sure. the different areas and see curriculum from that 10,000-foot that level and understand how all the pieces fit together. And um, that's one of the things we'd really like to talk about today is, mm -hmm. is creating interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary courses of study, units of study, lessons themselves. And I know that that's something that you have an interest in. So <laughs> it's fun. What, how, how did you get interested in, or how did you first learn about interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary? I think probably it was, I went to Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it was Sister Mary Navarre, and it was a children's literature class. Okay. And um, I think when you're working with interdisciplinary education, you need a good anchor. And I feel like some of the greatest anchors are literature 
you know, to build around mm-hmm. yep. science concepts to build around and social studies concepts to build around. I'm an elementary teacher, so mm-hmm. those are the places. And you want them to be meaty. Mm-hmm. You know, in kindergarten and first grade, back in the day, it was like apples and pumpkins and <laughs> Halloween and themes, mm-hmm. thematic themes. learning, yeah. mm-hmm. which is great mm-hmm. and works. And as kids get older, the themes you choose can become rich and deep and multifaceted. Well, and I'll say, under your direction, Lyola Press has done so much of that, that when something happens in society and we say suddenly, we need something around racism, we need something around an an ism of now, and you've been able to anchor teachers back to something and then build around it. And I didn't mean to, yeah, we need you to answer that other part, but but, but we've been doing this better over time but we see those children's books coming from Loyola Press. Yeah, one of the things, this wasn't a children's book, but this shows sort of how we like to react to the needs of the times. When COVID hit, um, I gathered the team maybe two weeks after the world shut down, so it was the beginning of April. And I said, friends, <laughs> we have we have no customers right now who are purchasing anything, but we have customers who are in deep need. Um, They've had to send their children home. We're trying to sort out what's going on in the world. We need to help them. One of the things we did was we converted all of our textbooks into digital format. They had not been converted at the time because people really didn't need digital, Mm -hmm. all their textbooks digitally. And I said, we're going to give them away for free. So new product development, stop what you're working on, start converting. So tech services, new product development, Mm -hmm. (laughs) work day and night. And within eight weeks, we had given away 74,000 free textbooks. Now, that's just kind of part A of the story. Part B sort of goes to your original question. We knew that we needed to help DREs, principals, teachers, catechists, parents, help um, create um, an understanding between faith and science because they are not. um, Yes. Amen. Big topic. So, we've right. talked about this on the podcast. Yeah. So yeah. what we uh-huh. did is we created a lesson on on um, the COVID virus, but how um, it, it was a science lesson really on good mm-hmm. hygiene and mm-hmm. community health, mm-hmm. but also it was about how that lines up with being a Christian and a good disciple and keeping yourself and others safe. Mm-hmm. So it was a where faith meets science lesson. We... I had my Which was timely because every teacher, every assistant superintendent, that's what I was doing at that moment, we couldn't find the word. It, the right. teachers want to do the right thing. I'm telling my five year old it's the sickness. Like how scary right. is that? Right. Like we don't we didn't have the words and sentences and you were able to jump in to provide that missing piece. Yeah, so we have this program called Growing with God Safe and Sacred. It's a child um Uh, abuse prevention program and a family life program and healthy relationships and good living program. So I said, okay, guys, you're going to make an emergency lesson (laughs) for growing with God safe and sacred. And you, we are going to put it online for free. I want every um, educational consultant to let people know we're going to figure out within two weeks, there were over 15,000 downloads of this lesson and from as far away as Kuala Lumpur. Um, Folks were just hungry. And so I feel like there's there's lots of opportunity for interdisciplinary. And you do have to look at what's going on in society today and then help these folks navigate it. Yeah. Um, it's really hard. Teachers are asked to do so much. And that's why I feel like interdisciplinary instruction is so great because it's a way to kill 15 birds with one stone. You know, you are able to take a theme um and or uh you know a a core unit and then build around it and make learning really rich and exciting and active but also um get everything in that you have to get in well so many teachers um when i'm out in the field speaking with teachers there's such a concern about instructional time Mm -hmm. why there there just aren't enough instructional minutes to cover this much of the curriculum or these standards and There's a way. So let's back up just a little bit and let's define, this is another thing I've learned Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the field is a lot of times we're using educational terminology, but we're not always meaning the same thing. So Mm -hmm. let's get on the the same page Mm -hmm. here. And Jill and I have different teacher training than you do. As an elementary person, you probably see 
interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary planning a little bit differently than we do. For sure. So can you, what is your definition? So if I were to define it, um, and maybe I can, I want to give examples, but in the elementary classroom for me, it is finding a way to um, teach two, three, four, I mean, you're in a self-contained classroom, right. subjects mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in an integrated way um, using a common theme, um, idea, uh, subject area as sort of the springboard mm -hmm. to bring in mm -hmm. math, science, social studies, okay. um, social emotional learning, faith. And teachers who feel like they don't, they want to get it all done, they want to do it right, it's so freeing for them to say, your reading lesson might come out of social studies or science or, right. or religion. Like, you're still going to wrap around the phonics and all the other pieces, mm -hmm. but you're... Build your core unit. Yes. And it takes courage and creativity and sometimes collaboration. Mm -hmm. yep. So you do that. You build your core lessons. And then you take a look at the standards and you say, okay, what have I hit? What am I missing? And it's very easy once you have that mm -hmm. lesson to be able to figure out how to plug it in. So at the junior high and high school level, though, like it's it's so very difficult. You mm -hmm. look at a look at any but so schedule. Fun. It's difficult, it's, but it's so it's rewarding. So, it's so much fun. <laughs> but if you look at the schedule that is developed for a high school teacher or a junior high, everything is compartmentalized, right? Yes. So they go to social right. studies. I'm and only they supposed to, science, to know science. They go it's like how do, I, I don't feel comfortable touching So how do math. we integrate that? <laughs> yeah. And that's where I learned about multidisciplinary projects was when I was working with um, junior high people where we had Here's the magic, the magic T word, time. We had common planning time because it does take collaboration, I believe. Imagine so that. for an elementary person where you're in charge of oh, yeah, you know it's what your, your own standards world. This are is my the kingdom. Board. Right. Yeah. Right? Beautiful. Uh -huh. So you can build it in how you wish. Different when you're working with others to mm -hmm. do that. So what's mm -hmm. your experience? I always like to push the limits. So I remember I remember knocking on the door of the video production class and saying, my students have to write argumentative papers. I want I want it to be something that they care about, but what if what if I shorten the assignment, and if they have to read it aloud, can you do some? Can your class do some animation? If we pitch the if we pitch this piece of writing, and then they hire someone to do the voice and they hire someone to do animation, so you have to figure out the right logistical mm -hmm. pass off because you there's right. not going to be a moment where the English teacher is going to be co-teaching with the video production teacher right. unless we went above us and pitched it to the principal. But if it was teacher to teacher, I said, hey, they'll be done by this date. Can we come visit your classroom? She then takes the project the next level. So yeah. we had to get creative around our own um, structures instead of going up a notch, which is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Now on the teacher leadership side, someone knocking on the door saying, well, we need time for collaboration. Like that I, I'm not wrong, time. but like that you're blowing up a whole system. Mm -hmm. So right. there's bottom up authentic ways to to push the limit a little yeah. bit and realize it's better for kids. It's better for kids. Yeah, it is better, better for kids, but it does take extra time outside of class time. Yeah. Um, and you I mean, teachers other, give so much. They do. Know. But otherwise, yeah. that video production class would have been writing their own scripts, not with an English teacher. Right. They, they had to do the work anyway. So we replicate work. Happens in elementary, too. Yeah. You're going to read during science block. Right. And then you're going to read something completely disconnected when you get to your reading block. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, so you actually why save time. You do save time. And mm -hmm. I do think it's so interesting in the middle school and high school arenas when it goes well. Everyone wants to know how and why you did it <laughs> and how they can replicate it mm -hmm. in their disciplines. So my, my brother is um, a teacher. He's a, an, uh, an English language arts teacher in a high school in Florida. And he is a former attorney. So he mm. started a law club. Well, he started this law club and two things happened. One was suddenly all the English language arts teachers wanted to get a hold of him and he started to lead. They they really integrated their writing, their, mm -hmm. their argumentative writing pieces in particular with Law Club. But the student council representative for the school came to him and said, 
you're stealing all my student council kids. <laughs> Can we collaborate and Perfect. work together so that these kids could be together? And that's what they ended up doing. And he he runs a moot court, basically. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. chooses judge, jury, defendants, lawyers, um, spectators in the crowd, family members of the people mm-hmm. accused. And every year he chooses one case usually based on a real case, and the kids learn and try it. Um, You're describing this concept of transfer that's so important mm -hmm. in curriculum world, where you learn, as a student, you learn something in isolation. And then us as adults assume students can transfer it to a new scenario, and it's really really hard. Kids don't transfer that. You know that when you get from unit one, two, and three in math, you assume they've absorbed everything like a sponge and suddenly they can use those formulas for the next chapter and they can't because they haven't transferred it. But then from an interdisciplinary angle, can they transfer their argumentative writing skills over to defending themselves in a courtroom? Like their brains have to make those connections. And when we can make those connections for them, they're one step ahead of realizing all of this is about the whole person, the whole child, the whole education, it all it all does go together by design, but we don't make those connections no, for them. But it's the it's that prior knowledge. You always have to start with prior knowledge. Well, how about prior knowledge from another class or you know, another right. thing that or other standards that you're being taught at that same time where it works really beautifully is with um, in high schools is with literature and history, if you can line those courses up. But if kids are reading literature that doesn't have anything to do with what they're studying in history class, that that is such a missed opportunity, mm-hmm. I believe. In, in any of the English classes I ever taught, um, I, I just remember back in the early 2000s, do you remember, you know, there was such a buzz about how American children don't know anything about geography. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> And so I remember being very intentional. My house is the house of geography. Uh, I talk about it all the time on the podcast, but it's so important. It's really the root of everything. And you can connect it to economics, literature, religion, everything, everywhere, all the time. So I always built geography into every book that I was teaching. So then I always had some kind of religion, whatever we were, you know, talking about in religion or in high school, just giving the Catholic worldview of what you're reading, right. building in some geography, and just doing multidisciplinary education myself. But it can be done much more intentionally mm-hmm. than that. Do Every you, person does not have to be an island. Do you find it works best in the upper grades with, like, two teachers collaborating, three te- what is the What's the best combination to make it work? And I think you find the person. You, you find, find the person the who's yes. willing to try the mm-hmm. risk. Mm-hmm. You find the colleague. Right. Yeah. You find the one who's, and then you say, we're just going to try this one. Are you willing to try this once with me? But that's and I did you that. I'm willing to try this when once I, with me. When I, I taught junior high, together. I worked with a junior high science teacher. We created the rubric together. Yes. My students were writing the, the research paper. She was grading the content. She it's was exhilarating. Her it's class. really yeah. fun. It's amazing. It's freeing. It's exhilarating. It's scary as heck because yeah. you're going away from the, the book. And um, it's really fun. You're letting something go in order to do it. But in elementary, there's so much to learn from the elementary teacher who's doing this all day because they're saying, hey, remember earlier today when we were talking about themes? Like it's just happening as part of that that classroom. And then we lose it once we start. When I I taught Westward Expansion, and thank God I have a a handy husband, um, I decided that we were going to pan for gold. The kids, I was teaching in California at the time. <laughs> so I had my husband take cheap tin pie pans and he cut out the bottom and then we put screens in them. And then I painted rocks I gold, <laughs> like little teeny rocks. We spray painted them gold. And then I, d- I made the custodian really mad. I dug a trench Oof. in the way back of the playground. Oh. We filled it in after, <laughs> put water in. And I literally took the kids out and they panned, they panned for gold. They will never forget that lesson no. as long as they live. They will know Sutter's Mill as long as they live. And it's part of their culture. I mean, they right. are they live in California. And those were the kinds of rules I broke and got in a little bit of trouble with. But it's okay. It was it was the best. It was mm-hmm. so much fun. I think it's so And necessary. we met all the standards. Yeah. There's that First. moment though afterward where you're you're riding that buzz of what that was so fun. This happens on field trips too. Where then you come back into the classroom, that next class period is so critical for us to acknowledge with the students 
the variety of ways that they learned. Like we learned a little science there, a little social studies, whatever it is. Right. Narrative, when we wrote our stories about how the day went, whatever it is. Making that final connection is so hard because then we rush on to the next unit. You went from mining gold to probably whatever that next unit was. Right. But we all have to remind each other, don't lose that last step. Right, right. Do the check-in. Yeah. Tie, tie it up. Tie it and up. And then also help them make connections to the real world and when I when you guys were talking earlier yes. I feel like when you were describing what happens in the middle school and high school I'm thinking how much easier will college be or a job be if these kids mm -hmm. um, have those experiences mm -hmm. when they're older right that connect with the real world right and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about methodology there a little bit because mm -hmm. uh, you know again you have, you have the movement aspect. You have them doing and, and writing and building and outside and in nature. And there's so many things going on there. So you're actually appealing to all of those different modalities that are so important too. You're not sitting in a classroom reading about it. Right. We're just right. talking about it. So right. it's fantastic. The secular world wants to call interdisciplinary STEM, STEAM, STREAM, like to like try to brand it as something. And I'm wondering your thoughts i mean are we is that the same as if we go back to definition is that the same as interdisciplinary or are we talking question. about something yeah. something different there because we're all trying to get at the same thing which is a well-rounded education right the right way right but you know what what do we say to that and what what's your opinion on it so that's really interesting so we have two faith formation programs at loyola press finding god our response to god's gifts and christ our life and in the school editions of those programs, we actually built in stream activities Great. That, that stem from faith formation. So faith formation is the anchor, and then science, technology, religion, arts, math, all stem from that unit or the themes in that unit. And um, I... I think it can be the same mm -hmm. and it also can be different. And I don't think either is wrong. Um, I, I feel like um, when education is aligned and things are moving in the same direction, mm -hmm. whether they are semi disconnected concepts or not, if it's working, keep doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah, right. right. And we know the best thing for curriculum is keeping students consistently through a whole program. Because the design that you put into inserting those lessons along the trajectory of the vertical alignment right. through a series makes the biggest impact because then you're, you are making sure there's no gaps, but you're right. also giving the teacher permission to expand. Okay, how is this applying to your other disciplines right now? I was thinking last night about this podcast being nervous, and I was, I was thinking about if I were a Catholic teacher today, what, were, <laughs> what would be some of the things I would do? And um, I was actually reading um, a beautiful quote about the fruits of the Holy Spirit for something else for work. And I thought, wow, what if, you know, peacefulness, you know, you're naming the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. What if you told the kids, okay, friends, on the playground this week, here are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Um, I want you to go out and observe. And when you see a classmate, mm -hmm. I was thinking either you give them little strips of paper mm -hmm. with a fruit of the Holy Spirit written on each of them, mm -hmm. and then they would give it to somebody that they observed doing it, mm -hmm. and then come back in and write about mm -hmm. that experience or what they observed. Because if you're doing expository writing or you're mm -hmm. teaching, you know, mm -hmm. journalistic who, what, where, when, why, and then you witnessed this behavior, and I thought, Oh, wow, that would be such a cool interdisciplinary lesson, right. building social emotional skills, but tying it back to, you know, the Trinity and the gifts that we are given and the fruits that we're given. Wouldn't and to be, be looking lesson? for it, right? We need yes, our, we need our children it. to be looking for it. I'm right. thinking about even having that one iPad outside. Where it's like when you see it, we're going to take a picture. Yeah. And that becomes the wall of our fruits. You know, oh, I love what does that. it look like? Okay. So the slip of paper, they'll the never photo. Have the have they'll the never visual. forget it. They'll never forget it. No. And they'll see the goodness that's in the church and the goodness that's in other people. Yeah. And imagine if you're the, you're the student that is approached. Like, I just saw... 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what did, what did I you what skills you. did I hit there? Yeah. I hit literacy skills. I hit social emotional skills. We could hit media skills, mm-hmm. um, technology right. skills. I mean, it's all there. Mm-hmm. And, and and then your art. If you're going to do something with with visuals, Joellen, you <laughs> mentioned earlier how much courage it takes for teachers to kind of break out of the mold, try something different, um, do some interdisciplinary work within within their um, classrooms. And I also think that that means that schools have to have a culture of risk-taking and, and courage is something that leaders need to, um, you know, really encourage teachers to go out there, put yourself out there, go ahead and give it a try. But you've built into curriculum, you said some, some STEM ideas into the religion curriculum. And that's a really great way for those teachers who really, um, you know, haven't tried it or don't really even you know, realize all the possibilities that are available with doing interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary instruction, you've built it in. And so you've kind of given them a stepping stone to what is possible. So I think it's easier when it's built into a curriculum to walk into your department chair, your administrator, your mentor and say, it's, it's in here. Let's let's try this. You know, it's it's prescribed for us, and so we do try to build into our um, programs multimodality learning, mm-hmm. interdisciplinary learning, and opportunities to bring learning alive for kids and teachers. It's it's way more fun to teach when the kids are having fun. Mm, oh, and, and the kids should always be working harder than the teachers. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. My well, good, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much it, for all you do, for all you've done, and for sharing all of your, um, your wisdom with us. Yeah. Thank you for all you do. You're touching a lot of people's lives all over the country, and it's just a blessing. We're so grateful. Thank you. All thank right. you. Thanks. There's always more ideas and time to celebrate them. Uh, We're grateful for the ideas that come in, but we're grateful to have you in the lounge today too. Thank you. Thank you. Catholic Teachers Lounge.